Hey, it's Paul here with JMP Cycles. Today I have a Dyna in the studio. It has a 96 inch engine in it now. Well, not for long. Thanks to SNS, we have a power pack kit. It's got a four inch bore, 585 cams. We're gonna up this thing to 110 inches. We'll get started by removing the seat, disconnecting the battery, and removing the gas tank. These in the next few steps are model specific, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on these items. Remove the air cleaner. On the other side of the bike, you'll need to remove the horn. Now raise the bike for easier access and remove the exhaust, making sure to disconnect the O2 sensors. I like to place the hardware in a plastic bag and tape to the exhaust so nothing gets misplaced. Next, unplug any connectors that may be in the way of the motor mount and then remove the top motor mount. At this point, you will use a quarter inch Allen to loosen the intake bolts. Completely remove the two bolts on the right side of the bike and loosen the two on the left side enough to be able to slide the throttle body and intake off as a unit. Pull the throttle body off and set to the side. Now collapse the throttle and idle cable so you can remove from the throttle body. Some people will remove the cables first, but it's either or, whichever is most comfortable for you. Set the assembly to the side in a safe spot. With all of that removed, I can actually get to the meat of the project. I'm going to go get washed up and we're going to tear into the motor. Now we'll remove the rocker box caps. Do this by removing the six bolts and then simply pulling off. You may have to give a slight tap with a dead blow or rubber hammer though to break free. Take out the spark plugs. With a flat jack, raise the rear of the bike. Now shift to high gear while rotating the rear tire. This will make the effort required to turn the engine over minimal. Turn engine over until both rockers on one cylinder are down and do not have any pressure. Remove the four bolts from the rocker assembly and the two from the breather and remove both the breather and assembly. Remove push rods and repeat on the other cylinder. Now remove the rocker bases. Again, you may need to tap with a dead blow hammer after you undo the bolts. Remove push rod tubes on both cylinders and you can start removing the cylinder heads. You may need a breaker bar to bust the bolts loose, but once they're loose, you can undo by hand. Remove the heads and set to the side. Now we can lift the cylinders off. Using either the Jim's tool or a pick, remove the wrist pin retainer clip and slide pin out of the pistons, being careful to not drop the piston. Do this for both cylinders, then we can move to the tappet blocks. Take out the four bolts from each tappet block, tap and remove. Now remove the tappet retainer and the tappets. Up to now, we've been in a rather oil-free environment, but now I want to go ahead and drain the oil before we go any further.
With the oil drained, remove the bolts for the cam cover, tap, and remove the cover. Now you can see the outer cam chain and tensioner. I use welding rod, but you can use wire, finishing nails, or whatever you have to put in the hole of the tensioner. This will keep the tensioner from fully extending when unbolted. Now undo the tensioner bolts and take off the tensioner. Remove the two bolts and take off the chain and sprockets, making sure not to change orientation of the chain. You're going to want to mark the chain with a grease pencil because it needs to be reinstalled rotating the same direction as before. Looking at the cam plate, loosen and remove the four center bolts. These are the oil pump bolts. Once those are out, you can remove the remaining bolts from the cam plate. Carefully slide the cam plate out and set to the side. Now remove the oil pump. We'll get started on the cam chest first. Open up the two boxes and lay out your parts. Using the Jim's tool, remove the inner cam bearings. Remove the O-rings from the cam chest. Now, pin and remove the inner cam chain tensioner the same way we did earlier with the outer. Again, mark the chain so that when it's reinstalled, it will be rotating in its original direction. Using snap ring pliers, take off the snap ring and slide cam plate off of the cams. There's also a spacer that will need to be removed. Now remove the new cam plate from the box and lay face down. Apply a generous amount of assembly lube and then you can get the new cams ready to go into the cam plate. Line up the dots on the cam and put the chain in place. Reposition the cam plate so you can install the spacer and snap ring. Before we install the chain tensioners, we need to disassemble and thoroughly clean them with brake cleaner and blow them dry with compressed air. Now that both of them are clean and reassembled, we can install the inner tensioner, lock tight the fasteners and torque them to spec. Now it's time to start installing parts on the bike. We'll start by applying assembly lube so we can install the new inner cam bearings. The bearings are designed to only go in one way and that is with the riding facing out. Place the bearings on the Jim's tool and you're ready to install. Screw in the four thumb screws to align the tool and then turn the threaded portion clockwise until the bearing sets. Once it's set, remove the Jim's tool and do the same thing for the other bearing. Just like the tensioners, we've got to clean the oil pump. So disassemble it and thoroughly clean it with brake cleaner and blow it dry with compressed air. Put some oil on the new oil pump O-ring and install it. Now install the oil pump by sliding one piece at a time, noting that the second piece has a notch that must go towards the engine. Once the pump is in place, use a straight edge to be sure no parts protrude past the mating surface of the cam cover. Install the two new O-rings that were removed earlier, clean the fasteners for the cam plate, and apply Loctite. Lube the cams thoroughly and slide the assembly into place. Snug up all the bolts and then torque the spec in the correct order. This is easy to do because SNS marks the plate with the tightening sequence. Now take the four oil pump bolts that came with the kit. Apply Loctite to them before inserting to the four holes of the cam plate. Snug, and then follow the tightening sequence while turning the motor over. It helps to have a friend to tighten until snug, then go back and torque to spec. 
Turn engine over to be sure there is no resistance. Place spacer on the rear cam and install the sprocket hand tight. Do the same for the pinion sprocket. Use sprocket locking tool and tighten both to 15 foot pounds. You need to ensure the tolerance is within 10 thousandths of an inch, so place a straight edge across the two sprockets and check with a feeler gauge. There are four different size spacers available from Harley Davidson, and it may be a good idea to have these on hand before you start the project. If you are within spec, remove both sprockets and reinstall with a chain, making sure the alignment dots are together. Now you can torque the two sprocket bolts, 25 foot-pounds on the pinion and 34 foot-pounds on the cam. With that done, we can install the cam chain tensioner. With the new plate and tensioner, we need to make sure that we have proper clearance with the cam chain tensioners. So, take some putty, place it on the inside of the cam cover where the tensioner would come closest to making contact, and then bolt the cover in place. Now take the cover back off and check to be sure that there's at least 30 thousandths of an inch clearance. If there is not that much clearance, you're going to have to grind down the inside of the cam cover, put more putty on and check it again. With proper clearance, clean all the bolts, apply Loctite, and install the cam cover with new gaskets. Torque to spec following the tightening sequence. Now it's lifter time. s and has their lifters already soaked in oil, so they're ready to drop in right out of the pack. Drop them in place, clean the tappet blocks and dowels, and install with new gaskets and torque disc back. If we were just doing cams, it would be push rod time, but we have a top end to do. You're going to need to wash the cylinders with warm soapy water to remove any grime or grit from manufacturing. Immediately dry with compressed air. Now clean with brake parts cleaner and wipe dry with a clean white cloth until there is no residue on the cloth. I see it's clean. Once this is done, immediately wipe cylinders down with oil. I personally use automatic transmission fluid. So we got to a nice stopping point and my ring end gap file had not shown up, so decided to call it a day. Now I'm rested, got a shower all cleaned up, even shaved a little bit, now we're ready to get going. I've opened up my rings and let me show you what we have here. First up, we have the top ring. You'll notice on the top ring there is a bevel that will go towards the piston as well as a dot right here. That dot will be facing upwards. Next up we have the second ring. The second ring has an N marked on the top and that N will go upwards as well. Now I've got the expander ring. The expander ring must butt together and face upwards so the angles of the ends will be facing upwards to the top of the piston. Next up you'll see the oil rails. Now the oil rails are the thinnest of the rings and can be faced upwards or downwards either side doesn't really matter. Okay so your piston rings have to have gap the top and the second ring that is they have to have in gap. To find the proper measurements we have to put the rings into the cylinder that they are going to reside. So we'll start with our top ring. We'll just place that right into the cylinder and then with my Jim's tool, this is an end gap tool, I can place that down and it is going to make sure that the rings are flush. Okay, now this ring has zero gap. It actually has a tiny bit of overlap. So top ring is supposed to have 24 thousandths to 26 thousandths gap. So I know that I need to take at least 24 thousandths off. I've got that. I will take it over to my in gap file. Just to give you a reference, this is a 24 thousandths feeler gauge. That is how much space I have to have. So this is a diamond wheel. It's kind of aggressive, so you don't want to go too quick with it because like I said, we're only taking off 24 thousandths of an inch. You're going to place the ring so that it is square and then turn counterclockwise. If you're standing over here, you're going to turn counterclockwise because you want the grind to come into the cylinder. All right, I'm not going to do a whole lot at once because I don't want to overdo it. So let me just do a little bit at a time and we'll keep on measuring. All right, now I'm going to take the gauge, see if I can place it between the gap. I cannot, so we are going to have to take out some more material. Basically, this is the process for all the way through. Follow along and check it out.
Sometimes this takes a few tries, but it's way better to go slow and remove a little at a time than it is to have to buy another set of rings. So yeah, it won't work. Once the rings are filed down, you can install on the pistons. Place the rings one at a time on the piston. Using the diagram and the instructions, make sure your end gap is in the proper location for each ring. Now do the same for the other piston and you're ready to go. Place rubber hoses over the cylinder studs and plastic sheeting over the case openings before attaching pistons to the rods. Apply assembly lube to the wrist pin and pistons like I'm doing, then install. Use the tool provided by SNS to insert the retainer clip on the piston and repeat for the other cylinder. Apply assembly lube to the base O rings and the two alignment O rings. Clean cases where cylinders will mate and put the two small O rings in place. Now I'm going to use the Jim's ring compressor, along with the help of Lowell, who happens to own this bike, to slide the cylinder in place. You do this by gradually sliding the cylinder over the piston while lowering the tool. You both have to work together at the same pace, or a ring may slide out and you're going to have to start over. It's the same process on both cylinders. Press the alignment dowels in by hand and place the head gasket on the cylinders. Make sure the heads are clean, especially at the mating surfaces. Set the heads in place and follow the detailed tightening sequence in the SNS instructions. Using new gaskets, install the rocker bases. Again, clean the hardware and follow tightening sequence. Put in the new breathers and reinstall the rocker assemblies followed by rocker covers. Now lay out the pushrod tubes for assembly and collapse pushrods to prepare for installation. Now get one of the cylinders to top dead center on the compression stroke. Slide pushrods into place and adjust pushrods until they're seated into the cup of both the rocker assembly and the lifters. Once they've seated, tighten another four complete turns and then you can tighten up the lock nut. Now pop the retainers in place and do the same thing for both cylinders. With the push rods done, let's put on some new seals and install the throttle body. Hook up all the wiring connectors and sensors, put in new spark plugs, install the upper motor mount and torque to spec. Hook up and adjust your throttle and idle cables. Install new exhaust gaskets, and then you can reinstall the exhaust. Don't forget to hook up your O2 sensors. Now change the filter and fill it up with oil. Now reinstall the air cleaner, horn, gas tank, and anything else is still undone. And you're ready to start the break-in procedure. All right, everything's all wrapped up. It's time to do the break-in. I accidentally started the bike up and went ahead and did the one minute break in. So on that, you're going to start the bike up, let it run from 1250 to 1750 RPMs for one minute. Don't crack the throttle. Don't put it under load. Just let it basically go just over idle. So when you first go to start the bike up, here's some things you need to check. First, you want to make sure your oil pressure light goes out as soon as the bike gets good and running. Second, don't freak out if there's a little bit of clatter. It's totally expected. Your lifters aren't pumped up. It'll take them a little bit to do so, and then it should smooth out.
As the bike's running, walk around, check for oil leaks. Make sure you don't have any leaks anywhere. You don't want that. Also, stick your hands near the exhaust ports to make sure you don't have an exhaust leak. Thing sounds like a beast. As soon as the bike cools down, we're gonna jump right back into our next three heat cycles. Then we're ready to go for a 500 mile test ride. Now the engine is cool to the touch, I'm gonna start it back up, let it run three to four minutes till it gets up to operating temperature. Again, don't crack the throttle, don't put it under load, just let it sit right at idle. 